Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new virtual dialogue uh, on Latin America. My name is Basil, and I work at the ADI Secretariat in Bonn. We are the European Association of Development Research and Training Institute, and we work towards improving the visibility of development and international development studies in Europe. We have many more events. If you would like to attend uh, future virtual dialogues, simply go to our website at eadi.org and the, under the events tab, you can register for all our future uh, virtual dialogues and other kind of events. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Luisa Sciari from uh, UCL University College London, and our moderator, Talia, will introduce her in just a moment. Our moderator today is Dr. Talia Vela Aiden, who is project officer here with us at EADI, and she has a long experience on sustainable development in the Latin American context. In terms of housekeeping, our talk today will last for about 20 to 25 minutes and will be followed by around half an hour or a bit more Q&A. Okay, Talia, so the floor is now yours for you to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to our ARD uh, virtual dialogue series. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Luisa Acciari who holds a Master in Comparative Politics from Science Po in Paris and a PhD in Gender Studies from LSE. She has spent the last two years working as a postdoctoral researcher at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro before joining the UCL Center for Gender and Disaster just recently in August 2020. I am most delighted also to have her to present us about Latin American domestic workers' struggles and answers to the COVID pandemic in Latin America. So thank you, Dr. Achari, for joining us. And now I kindly invite you to present your findings. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. When I was invited to give this presentation, I was still living in Brazil. And I thank you very much for accommodating me through the transition back to the UK. When I was in Brazil, I was also working part-time for the Interna International Federation of Domestic Workers. So a lot of what I will show you today also relies a lot on uh, this work and this partnership uh, with the unions of domestic workers. And I hope I pay a good tribute to their work and the resistance series during this crisis. So before getting to talk about their actions and uh, the pandemic, just a few data on domestic workers in Latin America. So there are about 18 million domestic workers in Latin America. But of course, a lot of them are informal workers, so it's, this might be an underestimate. Absolute majority of them are women. Quite important majority are for descendants. Of course, this will vary a lot depending on the country. So uh, countries like Bolivia, for instance, will have different configurations. But for instance, in Brazil, this is quite an important uh, data as this is uh, related to the, of the colonial history and slave trade. 17% are international migrants and they estimate between that they represent between 10 and 14% of the economically active women. Again, this varies a little bit country to country. Uh, for instance, in Brazil, uh, for black women, this is the first sector of employment. And it's about 20% of economically active black women who are employed as domestic workers. 75% are informal. By informal, we mean no uh, written contract or no formalized relationship, a working relationship. So that would have a lot of implications in terms of accessing social rights, social benefits. And in general, they earn less than the national minimum wage when there is a minimum wage or less than the average earning of other workers. So even though they work a lot, they uh, earn very little from this work. So I'm not going to give you a full review of the literature, but just a few reflections on why this is such a low paid and devalued job, uh, even though it seems to be so important and represents such an important part of the economic elective women labor force. Uh, so one explanation is the sexual division of labor and the devaluation of reproductive work as opposed to productive work. So because most of the tasks they do, taking care of people, cleaning houses, is considered as a natural women's job. Uh, it tends to be not really recognized as a proper job. And in fact, until very recently, in most legislations, it wasn't really 
cover by like labor codes or uh, labor regulations. It took a long time to recognize it as a proper job. Also, well, as I was saying, the colonial legacy, the colonial history of Latin America, the racial division of labor and important uh, racial inequalities. The fact that this job is located in the private sphere, so it may make it harder for the state to regulate and control or, or allows the state not to do it <laughs> if it doesn't want to do it. And also very highly stratified and equal societies. Uh, if you think of Brazil, for instance, where the income inequality is very, very important. So it allows the middle and upper class to buy uh, for very cheap, uh, for very low cost, um, uh, sort of cheap uh, labor force. Um, but for instance, in Brazil, it's about 6 million women who work as domestic workers. So it is very important to the society and to the economy even though they get paid very little for this job. And just a little bit of their history of organizing. So they started forming associations in the 20s in Chile, Mexico, in the 30s in Colombia, Bolivia, and Brazil. Usually at that time, they were not allowed to form labor unions. That would come later. In Brazil, it's only in 88 with the, the new constitution and the democracy, and it would be the case in most countries. So in 1988, the, the associations were just newly formed unions from seven countries gathered to form the CONLACRAO, the Confederation of Domestic Workers of Latin America and the Caribbean. It's the first regional federation of domestic workers to have been created. And then since then, obviously, they've been fighting and organizing. In the 2000s, two countries in Latin America passed very inclusive legislations in Bolivia and Uruguay. In 2011, there was quite important international events, so the ILO Convention 1 at 9, which guarantees decent work for domestic workers. And most Latin American countries have ratified by now, even though it's not fully implemented, but at least it's been ratified. Following from this mobilization around the Convention 1 at 9, the International Fed Federation of Domestic Workers was created, IDWF. And this is the, the Global Federation of Domestic Workers, and it's entirely led by domestic workers, and it's the only global federation led entirely by women. And in Latin America, IDWF has uh, 22 affiliated unions in 15 different countries, and this represents about 100,000 members. So during the crisis, IDWF did a survey with its members to, to see what was happening on the ground. Of course, we, uh, we imagined that uh, domestic workers were being hit hard by the crisis, uh, mostly because it's an informal sector, because all, all the sorts of uh, social, racial, sexual inequalities I was mentioning. So IDWF did a survey between April and May 2020 with the membership. And I won't go into too much details about the results because I want to talk more about the activism, but just to give you one important data that about half of the domestic workers we managed to get in touch with at, at this time had lost their job. And this was quite early on in the crisis, so between April and May, it might be worse now, uh, we, we don't know. But, and for the other half, the situation wasn't much better. So about a quarter was working normally. By working normally, we mean still going to the, you know, to the, the place of work every day. So probably taking transports, working normal hours, carry on their normal duties, which is mostly cleaning and taking care of people. So quite highly uh, dangerous uh, task in the, in the context of the pandemic. A very tiny minority was benefiting from a pet quarantine at their homes, and about 14% was working with losses, so either reduction of hours, reduction of wage. Uh, sometimes they were forced to take anticipated vacation, so they would lose their benefits, their, their entitlement to holiday. So quite quite dramatic picture, especially because, as showed at the beginning, the absolute majority is informal. So when they lose their job, it means they're practically entitled to nothing. And they wouldn't have access to unemployment benefit. They wouldn't have access to state support. In many cases, they, they don't have a written contract, so they can't even prove to the state or to the state agency that they have been fired. A lot of them are the main provider of their households, and they have dependents, either children or the member of their families. So their loss of income has also wide repercussions on, on their entire uh, uh, families and, and communities. This data corroborates a little bit other studies that were done at the same period. So a study by Jayalo, UN Women, and Sepal, also more or less 
during this period of the crisis show that 70% of domestic workers were affected by quarantine measures, either loss of job, wage reduction, or reduction of hours. And another study by Yarilo showed that 74% of domestic workers in the America were negatively impacted by the crisis. So we got quite similar picture in uh, IDWF survey and these other uh, studies. And like I was saying, informality means uh, if you lose your job, you don't have access to anything. And there was also an absolutely lack of uh, adequate state support. So some countries have tried to put in place emergency programs, emergency measures, but usually domestic workers were not really included or it was done in the way that it made it really hard for them to access those benefits. So we're talking about millions and millions of women who lost their jobs or lost income and were left without practically nothing. So it is in this, in this context that they are organizing and that they are trying to, to survive and to literally save their members and their co-workers from, you know, the necessity. Like we're talking people who don't have money to pay rent, who don't have money to buy food for their families. So a very, very dramatic humanitarian situation. So, of course, they were already organizing before and they have been fighting against very adverse situations before. And so, in a way, that, you know, uh, the crisis only deepens and reveals how unequal and how unfair uh, society treats domestic workers. And so domestic workers unions have been doing mostly three type of actions. Uh, one, which was very important, was informing their members, reaching out to them to, to provide information about their rights, about the crisis, about the virus, how to prevent it, if you're still working, how to try to protect yourself. Legal mobilization, so trying to impact on the state or local authorities um, through online or whichever uh, resources they had. And uh, humanitarian aid and solidarity with the membership, which is a quite new uh, repertoire for uh, labor unions, but became so important during this crisis. And all over Latin America, the unions are affiliated to IDWF uh, launched this campaign, Care for Those Who Care For You, or in Spanish, Cuida Quien Te Cuida, to really emphasize the, the importance of the work they are doing, but also contrasted to the way they were being left or um, treated uh, by the state. So who, who cares for those workers who care for us every day? So now we'll go over those three different types of actions. So information with all the little resources they had they managed to provide information so over whatsapp or over the phone to the members about firstly about what was happening about the virus in itself also about their rights during the crisis or lack of rights and really try to inform the workers about uh, the situation and so this is one example it's from mexico they did this infographic to explain a little bit how to protect yourself from being contaminated so, you know, if you go to work every day and then you come back home, what other steps you should follow uh, to keep safe? And they did another one for domestic workers. So at the workplace, so like if you are working with someone who has COVID or if you're taking care of elderly people who might get infected, uh, those are the steps you should follow. So just one example, they did these kind of things in the, almost all the countries. And they've been working on designing protocols and guidelines for the, for the sector and also addressing them to the employers. Uh, this is an example from Brazil. So you can see it's linking to the campaign. So you, you need to take care of who take care of, of you. And there are a few, few tips. So this is a card that was disseminated by WhatsApp to the members of, of this specific union. It's a union in the north, uh, northeast of Brazil, in the state of Paraíba. And so they made four small cards that they sent over to all the memberships. And here they give some tips relying on what the Minister of the Ministry of uh, Labor had indicated. So th those are sort of indications for the employers so that they should reduce the number of days of domestic workers. So to avoid making them going to the workplace every day, try to change the working schedule so they could avoid having to take uh, crowded buses and that they should absolutely make available to them hand sanitizers, protective equipments uh, to make sure they are safe at the workplace. The other type of action that was quite remarkable is the legal mobilization. And so I took the example of Peru, which I think uh, it's probably the, the, the biggest achievement in, in the period. So of, of course they have been fighting for uh, the implementation of the ILO Convention what, for 10 years now, almost 10 years, 
But the fact that they got this uh, labor reform during the crisis is quite uh, significant and it shows how important their mobilization was during this, this time. And, and also, I guess it shows that the situation was so dramatic, the state could not decently look away from it. So it, it builds on years and years of mobilization, but it did happen during the pandemic crisis. So I think this is quite an achievement and quite encouraging, in fact. So the, 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 the law change in Peru, uh, the process started in June, it was approved uh, just now in September. And just key points from this law, so it, it makes written contract compulsory. So it's a big step towards uh, formalization. It says that domestic workers should earn the national minimum wage, that they should not work over eight hours a day. And if they do, they should be compensated for it. That the employer should register them to social security. So in this time of crisis, this is particularly relevant. And that they can get access to compensation in case they are dismissed. So also extremely important right now. Of course, all of those things will come with different uh, conditions of application, but still, you know, we can expect that the crisis will go on a little bit longer. So it is very important that they achieve that now. There are other examples from different countries. Maybe we can talk about this more in the discussion. So in Dominican Republic, Colombia and Brazil, they mobilized to get domestic workers included in the emergency packages. So, for instance, uh, Brazil and Colombia had a very similar emergency package for informal workers, and they mobilized to make sure the daily labor, the diaristas, so those who work by the day, would be included in it. Of course, there was a lot of issues around how you claim it and how effective this was, but at least, you know, they opened the window for domestic workers to, to get access to this uh, fund. In Chile, they just got the right to unemployment benefits. There was a lot of cases of online agencies and litigations. In Brazil, they started doing litigations well, online, so from the union. So they would call the worker to come to the union, wear a mask, all the protective equipment. But instead of going to the tribunal, they would do it online. And they managed to get some compensations, for instance, for workers who had a working contract who got fired during the crisis or some cases of employers who contaminated their workers. They managed to do some legal actions against them. And there were numerous online meetings, conferences, negotiations. Some countries, the lockdown were really, really restrictive. So they were directly negotiating with government or members of parliament through Zoom and online meetings. That, that was very impressive because internet is not so easy to access for most of them. Um, I just really wanted to stress their incredible capacity to adapt to this difficult period. And then also very important action is the humanitarian action. Uh, so IDWF raised funds and managed to send money to all its affiliates in Latin America to distribute food and primary necessity uh, goods such as, you know, uh, hygiene products, uh, soap, uh, but mostly food. So those are a few pictures from, from Brazil, so from uh, Rio, Sao Paulo, and uh, Recife in, in the north. And for a lot of the members, for months, this is the only support they received, because either they couldn't access support from the government, or they were trying, but it got delayed. For the, the whole first months, uh, so March and April in Brazil, mostly, you know, the, the emergency package was being designed and implemented. So those who lost their job, they stayed about months and a half, maybe two months without receiving anything. So this action was really, really important. And so they received the support from the International Federation, but they also did very uh, creative form of uh, fundraising. So those are two cards from Brazilian unions. They, they just disseminated to everyone with the bank account of uh, the union and asked for um, donations. So whoever could make a, a donation. And they managed to get some, um, some important donations like through this fundraiser, a very improvised uh, fundraiser, but it worked and they, they did videos, they published in social media, so they're really trying everything they can to raise money to buy food baskets and hygiene products for uh, the members. And so related to that, something that I think is also quite important is a sort of um, a shift in the in the role of the union. So when you imagine labor unions, you imagine, you know, fighting for rights and dealing with employment issues. And then suddenly they had to literally take care of the members and worry about their survival and worry about their well-being. And I wanted to share this quote from Valdelisi, who is president of the union 
of Mar Maranhão, also in the north of Brazil. And she says that basically most of what she was doing during the quarantine was calling members every day just to check up on them and know if they were okay and just be a, a friendly face or friendly voice to talk to. And I thought it was so significant because she was also stuck at home. She was not working during the crisis and, and she took the time to call her members every day, every week, just to check on them. And it might look small, but I think, I think this is very important. And I think it shows a very uh, significant shift in the way a union can, can organize and the way unions uh, can resist during the crisis because taking care of each other has become so important in, and it should be part of union's agenda right now or any collective action. Uh, one of those actions should be taking care of each other. And very recently, the National Federation of Domestic Workers in Brazil, so through a project funded by the International Federation, has started these online support groups for their members, so dealing with mental health as well. And this is completely new. It's not something unions would usually do. And when they were talking to, to the members and talking to the, to the domestic workers, this is something, a, a demand that came from them. They were saying, we, we can't deal with this situation. It's too hard, we're too stressed, we're too anxious. We're getting depressed, uh, either because we're stuck at home or because we have too much work to do, or we're scared about what's gonna happen. And so they just started this last week, actually. And right now there are 10 online uh, super groups. So the domestic workers can connect through their phones and they have bi-weekly sessions. Uh, so it's a mix of, they will have some uh, education content on mental health issues and also a space to share with each other, talk about what's boring them. And so obviously we didn't have the resources to make a very individualized like therapy for each one of them, but this is the way uh, they managed to set up this, uh, this project. Uh, and so we'll see how it goes, but uh, so far 150, members in Brazil have registered, and so they will have access to these bi-weekly meetings and to January, I think. So, yeah, we hope it's gonna be useful for them. Uh, to conclude, just a few reflections. Maybe this is not new, but I think the crisis has really made it more evident than it was before. So we absolutely need more right, rights and universal rights, because a lot of the labor rights uh, are designed for people who are formalized, so workers who have a working contract and who are part of um, what uh, we call the literature st standard employment, standard work. Of course, in Europe, we also have non-standard work, but in Latin America, this is, in, in some countries, the majority of the workforce. So we really need to think policies uh, that include informal workers. And of course, ideally, everyone would be formalized, but it's not going to happen now, so we really need to rethink a way of making it inclusive and accessible to this very large sector of the workforce. Also, I think this crisis stressed uh, once again the importance of unions and collective action and how important they are to protect uh, the workers. And we really see in times like that how important it is to have a group who is there to, to support you and defend you and represent you. Also showed a completely, completely new role and new uh, demand for the unions, which is taking care, actually taking care of, of the members. And uh, suddenly they had to, to, to do humanitarian aid. It's not something they would usually do, but they, they just had to do it because the members had no money to, you know, to buy food or, or pay for the rent. More solidarity, obviously. Uh, a lot of movements have been saying this for years and years, but in a case like that, every little action count, every little donation count, Every little thing we can do makes a difference. And well, think of society with better access to health, including mental health, including for informal workers, domestic workers, you know, not only think about uh, programs to uh, give money and give food, which is absolutely vital, but also really take into consideration their well-being, including their mental well-being. Um, I think I leave it here and then I'm happy to open to the questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Luisa. It was a very nice presentation and also very comprehensive of the state of play, the situation of uh, the domestic workers movement in Latin America. And I found your precise differentiation of the ways in how they are coping at the present with the emergency situation also very enlightening and to look forward to new ways in which how the rights of domestic workers can be further defended 
in spite of the very difficult situation. So I have a first question for you, and it is if you could give more details on the IDWF, how is it that it's funded and what is its organizational structure, especially considering that it is a cross-country organization and uh, does it help provide in testing facilities for its members as well? How is it that IDWF has embedded itself in the work or uh, for domestic workers in the last uh, years? Thank you. So it was created from, I mean, from already existing unions and associations. And it came together at the moment of the global campaign around the ILO Convention 189. And so after the convention was approved, then all those organizations of domestic workers came together and decided to, to formalize into a, a global union. The headquarters is, is in Hong Kong, where the, most of the staff is and the general secretary is. But it has affiliates, I think it's 60 or 70 affiliates around the world. So Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Europe too. Obviously, I know more about Latin America, but it has affiliates all over uh, the globe. In some countries, domestic workers are not allowed to, uh, to form unions. So in this case, it would be associations or networks. It's funded a little bit from membership, but not a lot because it's hard to collect membership fees from the sector and through donations and projects. So it applies to um, international funds and projects and then we distribute to the members. So for instance, this humanitarian aid was, they, they did a fundraising specifically for that. And I think they also negotiated with funders to remanage some of the money they had for ongoing projects to be redirected towards humanitarian action. And what they do really is to support the work domestic workers do on the ground. So they help coordinate, they have representatives from each continent in the executive committee, but it, its strength is the, national or local organizations that were already there. And they have congresses every five years to decide together on the orientations uh, and you know, their uh, big policies. And uh, each region also has their own uh, forums for, for meeting and uh, working together. But the leaders come from uh, the movement of domestic workers. Thanks, Luisa. There is another question here. Do you think that the new role of unions will survive beyond the pandemic? Well, I can't know for sure, but I, I hope it will. I hope it will. And I think, I mean, obviously the situation they are going through right now is, I mean, it's major crisis, it's humanitarian disaster. So I hope this won't keep going on, but I hope that the, you know, the taking care of people and, concern for uh, members' well-being will, will keep going. And I, I found it very interesting that they started having all these discussions on health and mental health and, um, and, and the fact that they take time to call members just to check on them. I think this is something that they should probably remain, not only during the crisis, but I think it's a good practice to reach out to all your members once in a while and just check on them, see how they are, especially because they are I was saying they were very they were very precarious women. Sometimes they're uh, single moms, they're head of their household. So just having this organization that's there to support you and to uh, to check on you, I think can can make a big difference for those workers. So I hope that aspect of of caring and, and creating this solidarity will be going on. But obviously, I hope that the situation that created that uh, will be resolved um, soon. Thanks, Luisa. There is a new question here for you. Thank you very much for sharing this presentation with us and great to see the example of a law being passed in Peru. And the person would like to know uh, how is it being implemented and how do they ensure it's actually followed by the employer? And in my case, I would add to this, do you have uh, hints from other uh, countries that you have been researching on about how to really implement this in practice? So in Peru, it's very recent. It was, the final version was approved only in September. 
So I don't think right now we can say much about the implementation, but of course this is always the biggest challenge, I mean, for any legislation, but even more in this sector, because for it to really work, it means that the state uh, has to be ready to check what's going on in private houses. And so this is a huge question always. So my, my specific research is about Brazil. So in Brazil, we had a very comprehensive legislation in 2015 on domestic workers. And since 2015, what we can say that it has not been implemented yet. And that, that's the main reason. Of course, there was political crisis in Brazil and economic crisis. And a lot of employers uh, used that to say, you know, they couldn't afford pay, paying rates and everything. But the main question is how far is the state willing to go? How far is the government willing to go to check what's going on in private houses? And very often it's not willing to do it. So I don't know what is the one, I, I don't know how to suggest one solution, but to really implement this legislation, you can't just rely on the goodwill of employers. We need some mechanisms of checks inside the households, uh, labor inspections, or I don't know exactly how that would work. So we'll see what happens in Peru. As it just passed, uh, we need to wait a little bit more. Of course, this is one of the main questions and it's a big part of the campaign is to say, now we have to implement it. But it's a bit recent yet, but what we can see in other countries is that, of course, implementation is always the biggest issue. <laughs> Thanks, Luisa. Graciela would like to ask you that based on your experience, what is the way forward to make these unions and groups stronger and more representative for their cause? In Brazil, the unions and the regulated work have been also under a systematic attack by the government. Many changes in the law had impacted negatively the workers' rights and especially the rights of association. How do you think is the way to increase the political representativeness of these workers? Yeah, it's a very good question. Of course, the situation in Brazil is, I mean, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, everyone is being attacked and they're planning, it, ha it hasn't gone out yet, but they are planning a labor reform, which will be a disaster if it goes through that they wanted to. They are thinking of changing the way uh, representation works and they're thinking of changing the conditions to recognize the unions. And if that goes through, it would mean specifically for domestic workers because they have a very low membership, obviously. It's really hard to organize the sector. So if that proposition goes through, the impact would be dramatic. So what's the way forward? I mean, I would usually say, you know, increase, increase, go back to the base, go back to the rank and file, recruit, do outreach, try to recruit as many as you can build a strong base so even though you can't dialogue with the state or even though you know you can't really hope for social dialogue at least you you, you keep building your membership but obviously in to make things worse we're in the middle of a pandemic crisis so how how do you reach out <laughs> i mean you you can't go house to house or door to door to 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 find the workers this is a very very challenging time but one of the things that they've been doing that that is working is this calling out everyone, checking on them. Uh, they have recruited people through the humanitarian action. So this union I was working with in the, in the state of Rio, in the city of Nova Iguazu, a, a lot of the women who received the, the humanitarian aid are now going to the union to help, doing little things in, in the union, but, you know, helping them just cleaning up the union or just being there for the day. Uh, so this is creating a sense of community and solidarity. But obviously, the fact that you can't go out in the streets and that you can't meet the workers makes it really hard to recruit. But I'm sure that there are ways, I mean, there are ways to do it online, right? Internet is not easy to access for everyone. But in Latin America, WhatsApp is quite popular. So if, if the unions and if the, let's call it the progressive side, manages to really get hold of you know whatsapp and online uh, tools i think it might be able to create this uh, membership base or strengthen these bases through other types of action but uh, yeah we are combining especially in brazil we're combining a very uh, adverse uh, government plus a situation of pandemic so it's yeah 
it's not easy. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Camila has also another question for you. It is how big is the share of inform informal workers that are members of the unions that you have been researching? Most of the members are informal. It's not a condition to join usually that you're formal or not. I don't have the rates. I don't know the rates, but um, for instance, the National Federation of Brazil has about 12,000 members. Uh, which at the same time is big, but it's not, you know, it's nothing compared to 6 million workers. But most of them would be, uh, well, diaristas, so they work by the day, which means they're not formal. It's not a requirement to join uh, the unit. So, yeah. Thank you, Luisa. I'm not sure if somebody else has further questions. So otherwise, yes, please go ahead. Okay, a new question is here. Uh, do you expect a shift in the nature of informality in the future, especially looking at the domestic work sector? I'm not very optimistic, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think the responses we've seen from the government during the crisis have been very encouraging. And I, I'm not seeing any measures to encourage formalization. So the most uh, uh, positive uh, or the greatest achievement we saw is this legislation, in, this labor reform in Peru, which makes a written contract mandatory. So if this is implemented correctly, it will increase formalization. But for instance, for, I mean, in Brazil right now, I'm not very optimistic. I don't think there will be any actions to support formalization. And I think the best thing we could hope for in this current situation of crisis is that policies are designed to really include informal workers so domestic workers but also you know street vendors waste picketers so all the, this uh, informal workforce i think this is the best thing we can hope for now is that the policies are designed in a way that it also reaches them and includes them but for brazil specifically i mean i can't speak for every latin american country it's not i mean i don't have that uh, knowledge like I do for Brazil, but for Brazil, I don't see any measures right now that would promote formalization or that would, I mean, this is not a government that wants to reduce inequality. It's not a government who wants to defend the workers. It's not a government who cares about domestic workers, clearly. And just as a, you know, the parenthesis, uh, uh, Bolsonaro, when he was still just a congressman, not the president, he, he was the only one to vote against the domestic workers legislation in 2015. So... Uh, yeah, I'd say we should keep uh, organized and fight to make sure he doesn't win again the election in 2022, in 2022. but um, yeah. Uh, probably the best course of action is to make sure they are included in any emergency packages or any um, uh, uh, rescue fund um, for now. Thank you very much, Luisa. So I keep then the the word of Basil, if he would like to add something at this point. Yes, thank you, Luisa, and thank you, Talia, for moderating. It was a really interesting talk, so we can ask one last time if there's any more question. And if not, we can close up the discussion. Actually, Graziela just mentioned that the first death by COVID-19 in Rio de Janeiro was a domestic worker called Cleonis, 63 years old and she was contaminated by her employer who was returning from Italy. I don't know yeah. if you have heard about this, Luisa. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, not only the first death in Rio, but it was the first confirmed death in Brazil. And uh, so obviously for the movement, it, it, you know, it became a very symbolic death because uh, when it all started, everyone was saying, oh, you know, we're afraid that our cleaner is gonna contaminate us. And then it was exactly the reverse that happened. And there was another case right after this one in the state of Bahia, and, and then it kept on going and we had other dramas related to the crisis. So there was this young boy called Miguel who died, a five years old boy who died at the workplace of his mother during the crisis because his mother was called on to clean the house of employers. And then uh, the employer, the, the white, you know, upper class woman from the city of uh, Recife asked the employee or the domestic worker to go out and walk the dogs. And she was supposed to look after the kid during this time. So the, you know, the already started all, all wrong because 
you, there was a, a sort of a guideline from the government saying that domestic workers should not be called to work unless it is absolutely essential. So like if you're caring for another person, for instance, in this case, it was not absolutely essential, you know, walking dogs and uh, so, I mean, it's hardly a you know, vital task. And so, and she had to take her kid because school were closed. So she was there with her five, five years old boy. And so she went out to walk the dogs and the employer was supposed to look after the kid, but she put the kid in the elevator and, and he ended up in, in a high up floor and, and he ended up falling off the window and, uh, and dying. And uh, so it's not directly COVID, but you know, it's the situation created by the, by the pandemic. And, and there are cases like that all the time happening. And so yes, Cleonice Gonzalez was a big, in a way sadly was expected, you know, that the, the poorest would be, would be the first to die. And when you see the numbers, we know black people are more uh, at risk than, than white people. And, you know, we have a public health system, but it's overcrowded, like, I mean, like in Europe, but, uh, of course, the consequences is different in a country where inequalities are so high and uh, informality is so high. So uh, some people have been talking about, you know, organized genocide or necropolitics or, uh, yeah. The, and, and obviously, I mean, the, and, and then the president goes on TV and he says that people die, it's life. And yeah. I, mean, I, 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 don't, I don't even know how to, how to, what to say. I mean, it is, if, if you look at it, literally, the, the Brazilian government is, is letting poor and black people die uh, by, not, by not taking any actions to stop the virus and by not protecting the poorest. Uh, it is letting them die. And domestic workers, I mean, the latest figures from like labor data market, labor market data, so that it's about 2 million of them out of 6 million who have lost their jobs in Brazil. It's 2 million women who are unemployed and who are not benefiting from any state support. So, but by not doing anything, it is creating, if they don't die of COVID, they would die of uh, hunger or uh, other related situations, humanitarian uh, health, poverty. So, yeah, but yeah, thanks for yeah, bringing this up. Is, this is something observed in many other parts of, of the world as well, that the, the COVID crisis can also trigger hunger crisis or other kind of related health crisis. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much, Louisa. If there are no more questions, we will wrap things up. Can I just mention that on the 3rd of November, we have another virtual dialogue, also moderated by Talia, about Peru and about the migration patterns from the urban areas of Peru into the less urban areas and return migration and the effects on local communities. Can I also mention that if you are a student, membership for EADI is free for a year, so you can also check that on our website. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for participating and wishing you a very good day ahead. Thank you.